Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Spencer. I'm with Hawley Consulting Engineers. Uh, we're mechanical and electrical consultants. Um, we were uh, responsible for the mechanical and electrical engineering design on, on our block phase two, where you are now. Um, and I've been asked to try and give an engineer's perspective of the scheme. Um, so here's a brief sort of, these are the four items I'm going to try and cover. I'll give a brief introduction, uh, talk about why low carbon buildings uh, and what our approach to low carbon buildings tends to be. And then we'll look at uh, a case study of our block phase two in a little more detail. So by way of introduction, we've heard from the architect and uh, now it's our turn. Actually, um, the key to good low carbon design is a collaborative working approach. So it's not so much, you know, uh, here's an architectural scheme and we'll fit it out in terms of building services. We have to have a much more integrated and coordinated approach to what, what we do in terms of the design of the building itself to look at passive systems as far as possible. So really what we're talking about is a holistic approach to maximize the potential of any low carbon solutions that we adopt. So hopefully we'll demonstrate how that's been achieved on, on our block. So to start with, just as a brief introduction, why low carbon buildings? Why are we talking about low carbon buildings? Well, the International pa Panel for Climate Change, their fourth assessment indicated that there's a 90% probability or greater than 90% probability that uh, climate change is man-made and it's not of natural causes. And the primary cause for that is greenhouse gases and carbon emissions. Now, the UK has signed up to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions based on 1990 levels by 80% by the year 2050. And the green line on that graph shows the route map that we should be adopting. The orange line at the top shows the performance that we're currently achieving. So effectively, we're not achieving what we've signed up to. So the white dotted line is then indicating where we need to get to. So it's indicating that we have to increase our rate of carbon reduction over where we currently are. There are a number of legislative drivers, and Matt has already spoken about most of these, so I don't think I really need to go through them other than just to point them out again. Building regulations, part L2A, it's a legal requirement, we have to comply. You've then got um, energy performance certification, which is basically your sort of mechanism to, all, all new buildings need to have it, and it's a mechanism of rating how well they perform from an energy point of view in terms of energy in use. And the way that it's graphically represented is in a similar way to white goods on domestic equipment. So you have an A to G rating scale where A is the best and, and G is the worst performing. BRIAM is the uh, Building Research Establishment Environmental Assessment Method, uh, which is a way of gauging how well a building performs overall from a sustainability point of view and that looks not only at energy but it looks like looks at uh, water conservation it looks at ecology transport lots of different uh, lots of different aspects but energy has a has a much higher weighting than a lot of the other items so clearly energy and carbon emissions reduction is is an important factor these are the sort of, in terms of those three key areas, these are the things that we think good low carbon design targets should be achieving. So obviously from part L point of view, you have to achieve compliance. BRIAM, as a minimum, you want to really aim for excellent and outstanding if you can possibly achieve it. Uh, and then from an energy performance rating, uh, a realistic target is somewhere between sort of 30 or 32 to 37 uh, with, good, with good design. Uh, and that will uh, relate to a B rating. Other drivers' benefits are obviously clearly it reduces energy consumption and therefore carbon emissions. It will result in lower annual running costs, which clearly there's a monetary incentive if you, if, if you produce a building that has lower running costs and it saves you money. Within, specifically within the higher education sector, there's an obligation to reduce overall carbon emissions um, over a particular estate's uh, or a particular HEI's estate over the 2005 levels by 2050. And that's something that all HEI's have to set themselves, but it has an impact on hefty funding potentially. So it's an incentive for individual um, higher education establishments to look at how they're um, moving their estate forward. And obviously there's a, there's a corporate social responsibility, which I think we'll hear from uh, later. So what is the approach to low carbon building design? Well, 
fr from our point of view, it's fairly straightforward. There is a basic approach that needs to be adopted and we look at a four-step approach in that. Obviously, we want to use less energy, but what does that mean? We think it really means looking at passive building design as far as possible. So that's working with the architects and the remainder of the team to make sure that we've got the building orientation right. We're maximizing the performance of the facade treatment and the elevation elevations and how they work. We're, where you've got a uh, specific building user, then you can look at the, the location of spaces within the building so that sensitive spaces aren't put on elevations that could be um, subject to more thermal gain, for example. So we need to make the building work as hard as it can for us. Once we've done that, we can then look at the engineering systems that we're putting into the building, and this is then the be clean solution. So, you know, we're putting in energy efficient plant, the systems that we put in, we ensure that we only circulate the right amount of um, heating water, for example, in the heating systems, and they are variable volume so that they only circulate what we need. Um, we can look at um, the lighting installation and ensure that that is as energy efficient as we can make it. Once you've done that, then you can start to look at the renewable energy solutions. And this is where we then put in zero carbon or, or low carbon solutions to produce the energy that we need to use within the building. So that could be thermal solutions such as um, biomass or um, ground source heat pumps, for example, and that we can use that energy within the building. Or we could look at electrical generation such as PVs or, or wind. That's the be green. So the, the, the three-step process in terms of energy is be lean, be clean, be green. And if we can do that, then we get the overall carbon emissions down. There is a fourth step, which is not specifically related to energy, but it's part of the overall sustainability uh, agenda. Uh, and this is where we can look at other solutions. If we look at wa water conservation, rainwater recovery, for example, for using flushing in the WCs and uh, in urinals. That is something that we have adopted on this scheme and it was, a, it was also done on, on the phase one scheme. All, all of those four steps do need a coordinated and a collaborative working approach between all of the design team members to ensure that you know, we get the optimum solution. So to look at that graphically, that, that would be the start point. So CO2 emissions going up the page, that would be a, a baseline scheme which is a Part L compliant building. If you then look at passive design, so these are the solutions that you put over and, over and above the base scheme. So you look, you look to drive the, the facades harder, you look at the orientation and so on. Then you reduce your carbon emissions there. Then we look at putting in our efficient systems and we can reduce carbon emissions further, step two. And then step three, if it works, is application of the renew renewable energy solutions and the renewable energy technologies. So overall, from a baseline Part L building regulation scheme, you, you can reduce your carbon emissions quite significantly. And that's hopefully what we've, what we've adopted on this building. So moving on, this is now the case study for this building. And I think we've seen this sketch before in Matt's presentation, but that was something that, um, that we drew up in conjunction with Strides at a very early stage in the process and was looking at what we could do with the ex with extending the existing building into phase two and the sorts of systems that we could look at possibly implementing. I won't dwell on it too much, but that's, it's an interesting sort of start point as to, as to where, we, um, where we came from. So this then is, um, again, we will have seen this sketch, but this is, this is then picking up the key passive elements of, of the building, um, which is we're starting with phase one, so really, whilst, whilst we looked at whether we should crank the building a little bit, actually all we did is extruded it. So phase two is basically a direct uh, extension of phase one. So we retain the north-south facing aspect of the building. And that works well for us because we can, can tr control the solar gain on a south facing elevation much better than we can on east and west because we have high sun angles and it's much easier to control. So what we look at doing is, is having on the south elevation, which is vulnerable to solar gain, we have more solid elevations and we have smaller windows. We also look at putting processes or spaces within the building that don't need natural daylight, such as this, on the south facing elevation. We incorporate um, uh, overhangs on the roof to make sure that we can control the, the solar gain to those elevations. And then on the north side, which is the far side of the drawing, 
therefore we can have much larger areas of glazing because we're north facing, we're not subject to a lot of solar gain, so we can deal with that on a much better basis. You're starting to see on this then the, the introduction of the vertical chimneys, which is dealing with the cross ventilation, and I'll come on to that uh, in a sec. So in terms of passive cooling, we've got a building and what we don't want to do is put any forced mechanical cooling in the building. So the way that we've achieved that on our block is to expose, in the teaching spaces, expose the thermal mass, which is i.e. the concrete soffit of the space. Now that acts effectively as a, as a sponge to absorb heat during the day and it evens out the peaks and troughs in um, incident solar gain. So the sort of graph on the right hand side, indicate the green line down the middle is a heavyweight structure. So the variation in internal temperatures is much smaller. If you have a lightweight structure, then it's much more, sub, um, much more subject to external heat gains and therefore the internal temperature will rise and fall on a much higher peaks and troughs. So by introducing thermal mass, you stabilize the internal environment and you also in, end up with an element of passive cooling. That has to work in conjunction with a nighttime purge, nighttime purge ventilation, so that um, you can reject that heat that's been built up during the day in the slab back to outside. So I'll come on to it again in a sec when we talk about the ventilation more, but we part of the ventilation strategy is to allow the building to open up at night to reject the heat that's been absorbed by the slab back to atmosphere. So the ventilation strategy is probably one of the key aspects of the building design. And there are there's three sort of key aspects. One is, um, I know it's noisy, but one is the mechanical ventilation in here. Two is then what we're, how we're dealing with natural ventilation to the teaching space on the north side of the building. And then a slightly different approach is how we deal with the natural ventilation to the teaching space on the south side of the building. So dealing with uh, the south-facing aspect first, what we actually introduce is two, for, two openings in the facade, effectively, a high level and a low level. And that works best in terms of a, a natural ventilation process if you're looking at a single-sided solution because you get a general circulation of, of air through the space if you have high and low. The way that it's been configured is that the high-level windows are manual and they're on a, effectively a teleflex and they allow occupants to have an element of, of user control for rapid ventilation. And then at low level, we have a louver arrangement or a grill on the outside of the building. And then in board of that, we've got a motorized damper, which is a low leakage damper, which shuts off outside air from the building. Now those, that motorized damper is controlled on a combination of internal CO2, carbon dioxide levels, and uh, temperature. So if the, if the level of CO2 within the space is, is going above recommended levels, then those dampers will crack open to allow some ventilation into the space. They will also operate on temperature. So if the temperature goes above a certain level, then they'll open up, and this will typically be more to, towards the sort of summer periods. They will tend to open up more to let more ventilation through to try and deal with the overheating scenario. So that's what it looks like on the outside. And then on the inside, this is the, the same, the same, well, it's the opposite side of the building, but it's the same configuration. So the high level windows there are manually operated. The low level louver, which sits behind the radiators, is then controlled by the damper. So by putting a radiator in front of it, the idea is that when you need those low level louvers to open, the radiator, in, particularly in winter, the radiators will preheat the air before it comes into the space. So you're not getting a cold blast of potentially minus four uh, degrees C air coming into the building. On the north side, this is where you will have seen this now as, you, as you've gone around the building, but on the north side of the building, we've introduced the uh, chimneys, uh, effectively the, the wind catcher stacks, and that's to allow us to, for those teaching spaces, as Matt explained earlier, potentially have much higher internal heat gains than at some of the other spaces, and potentially the occupancy in there is also much higher. So we need to create a cross ventilation through there, which we, which we couldn't do unless we introduced these uh, vertical chimneys that run through the building. So on all of those teaching spaces, we have a series of those vertical stacks. I think there's about seven, six or seven. And then on the rear face of 
each of the teaching spaces, we've got a louver, and again, that has a motorised damper behind it, and that links into, into the chimney stack. So the perimeter um, louver, motorised damper arrangement, is linked to the internal face, so that when one opens, the other one opens, and they just then allow that air movement to, um, to pervade through. The one space that we can't really naturally ventilate effectively is the space that you're sitting in now uh, and this is the this is due to the fact that it potentially it has a very high occupancy and we can't get external windows because we don't want external windows in in this space and therefore we need to we needed to look at mechanically ventilating it what we didn't want to do is mechanically ventilate a space with a high volume of air that then needs to be treated in summer and winter in terms of um, if, it's, if it's minus four outside, clearly we can't push minus four degrees C air into the space, so we have to heat it. In summer, ideally, if, you know, if it's 28 degrees outside, you don't want to push 28 degrees C air into the building. So we needed some mechanism to try and look at how we could temper the fresh air without using lots of energy. So this is where the ground coupled ventilation system was proposed. And this is where we, we use a series of buried ductwork linked to an intake position that we then draw the air through and then push it through an air hand or a couple of fans effectively in an air handling unit and then through into the ventilation system within the space. The way that that works is because the ground is at a relatively constant temperature, when we're looking at extremes of temperature outside, ambient temp and outside air, because you're running it at a relatively low velocity through this ductwork in the ground, that air is picking up the energy from the ground. So effectively, we get around about a four to five degree C differential. So it minimizes the amount of energy that you have to put into the air before it's introduced into the space. It's quite a difficult thing to um, get your head around. So hopefully this, this sort of animation, if it runs, will sort of show the, the principle of the thing. So this is, this is actually the building and you can see the ventilation chimneys running through the core. This is effectively what we end up with, which is an intake position, um, which is outside. I'll show you an image in a sec. And then this is the series of ductwork that's buried below the ground. So the air travels through that, comes into a fan in the air handling unit, which is in the plant room just behind, and then runs through to these three um, high level socks, and then that's introducing air into the space. The exhaust system doesn't quite work as, as shown on here, but effectively it's those two grills over there is, is, is the exhaust point. That is then taken back to another fan as, as part of the air handling unit and then discharged to outside. So that sort of shows in principle how, how the system uh, is intended to operate. The image on the left is, is basically how the, the ductwork in the ground is laid out. Uh, and the photograph on the right is the intake bollard, which you, you can see is, is, is if you walk around the outside of, of the building. Space heating, um, so that's ventilation. Space heating is dealt with via a combination of radiators, which basically just sit below, um, below the windows in the teaching space. And then within the, um, within the cafe, we have an underfloor heating system, which operates at a, a lower temperature than, than radiators need to. So you're not having to push uh, as high a temperature, which therefore has a knock-on effect in terms of the amount of energy you need to heat that space. Of course, it's not, it's not just the sort of the thermal environment that you need to control from an energy point of view. You also have to look at uh, the electrical side of things. Lighting, artificial lighting can be one of the, one of the biggest consumers of electrical uh, energy in a building. So we've had to look very carefully at how we, how we deal with that. Um, the key issue here is because we had exposed concrete soffits, we had to have a suspended lighting solution. That then, so we put uh, high, high efficiency lighting uh, lamp technology in, but we also the key thing is to look at how that's controlled and what should be happening is that all of the lighting is PIR, so passive infrared controlled, which works on movement and detection of people. So they will only come on if there's people actually using the space. More importantly is that they're linked to the amount of daylight that's coming in through uh, the windows, the, the external facade. So we know what lighting level we need for, uh, for the users in the space. But if, if we're getting sufficient daylight, then there's no need to, to use the artificial lighting. So what should happen is if the lighting level outside drops, then the artificial lighting comes on, but it will only come on in terms of its dimmed level to the point at which it needs to illuminate in the space. So again, that, that saves a significant amount of, uh, of energy and therefore carbon. <laughs> 
Um, another, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but as a mechanical engineer, because this is electrical, on, on this building we have a voltage optimization solution. And this is basically black box technology that goes on the incoming supply and it conditions the electrical voltage coming into the building. And by cutting out the peaks and troughs of the voltage frequency, you effectively save energy. So all of your electrical consumers on the end of it aren't consuming as much electricity. And the estimate for our, it, it works better on retrofitting on older buildings than it does on new buildings. But even on this building, we think that we're going to achieve something around about 10% reduction in the overall electric, electrical consumption by introducing this, this technology. So having gone through the be lean and be clean technologies, we then come on to what we might be able to do in terms of renewable uh, solutions. Now, we, we looked at a number of different possibilities for the scheme. Photovoltaics, they were, um, they were considered, they are on phase one, uh, and they were retrofitted on phase one. They weren't introduced on to phase two, but we've got the capability of retrofitting them at a, a later date. There was, um, there's a cost issue, so they're not included. They weren't necessary to achieve the targets that we were trying to achieve, but there is a possibility of retrofitting them at a later date. Wind turbines, um, I think there was, but on a site of this scale and location and being close to residential accommodation and so on. Wind turbines were considered, but they weren't, um, they weren't uh, considered to be the appropriate solution for this scheme because of scale. We looked at ground source heat pumps, and that, in fact, if you go back to the very first sort of initial uh, concept sketch diagram, that was one of the technologies that we were looking to uh, implement. Effectively, a ground source heat pump solution would sink a number of boreholes into the ground through which we uh, take a a series of pipe work effectively and it works in the same way as the ground coupled ventilation so because the ground is in uh, because the pipe work is in contact with the ground you effectively can abstract heat or cooling from the ground just by circulating water through the, the network of pipes that you have buried beneath the building you can then take that and stick it through a heat pump and then take um, higher grade energy off of the heat pump to put into your building systems the problem is that it costs a lot of money to stick the boreholes down so the overall system costs a lot of money and it wasn't taken forward on this scheme. Combined heat and power, just talk about that one first. Uh, I think because of the scale and the nature of the, the building loads, it just was not considered feasible for, for the scheme. Whereas biomass was, and Matt talked about it earlier, I mean, we were very close on whether we went for a biomass solution but something that the uh, estates team were very keen that we look at is a biofuel solution rather than biomass. Biomass is using wood fuel, so it might be wood, wood, wood pellets or wood chips coming from various uh, waste processes from the production of, um, of timber products and so on. Biofuel, however, is biodiesel, so it comes from, um, in this case, actually what, what we looked at is recycled cooking oil. Um, which comes partly from the university processes and partly um, off-site. So the solution that we ended up with is rather than go for biomass, we went for biofuel, um, which does run off uh, recycled cooking oil. And based on the calculations that, that were undertaken, um, we think that we'll get somewhere around 80% of the annual heating load for the building through using waste, waste cooking oil effectively. So that, that's the technology that is used on this scheme. Putting it all together, uh, we've got part L. Um, the, there's a couple of images from the dynamic thermal modeling that we undertook. Uh, to achieve compliance with part L, and this is under the part L 2006, because that's when this building was, uh, was designed, um, you need to, your, the building emissions rate, which is the, uh, the uh, carbon emissions from the proposed building needs to be uh, less than the target emissions rate for a compliant building. So the TER, the target emissions rate for, our, for this scheme was 17.5 kilograms of carbon per meter squared per year. Uh, and we actually ach achieved 12.3. So it's a 31% improvement over Part L 2006. Now with 2010 um, regulations coming in, it still achieves about a 5% improvement over where 2010 is. So even if we were to rerun it now under the latest edition of 
part L, we're still going to comply. Um, again, we've seen these. Briam, we've achieved uh, an excellent at just under 72%. And the energy performance certification, we ended up achieving 35, which is a, which is a high B rating. Right, just to finish, six months on, we were finished in about August last year. Uh, it's five months since full occupation, so the building's gone through a relatively cold winter, uh, and there has been some um, problems experienced with the space heating system. Um, one of those things was adequate sealing of the perimeter um, louvers. We were getting um, too much infiltration when we didn't want the infiltration, so cold air was allowed to come into the building. That's been addressed and those have been resealed. There's also a question of fine tuning how those low level um, external motorized dampers and louvers are controlled. They're based on CO2 and temperature, as I mentioned earlier. They weren't working in the optimum way at the moment because they were, again, they were opening up too much or not enough. So we're going through a process of trying to fine tune how the system works. And actually what you find in any effort to come up with a passive um, building, you will find that there is a lot of fine tuning that you end up having to do. And I think that's the key thing to take away is that, you know, you design these systems to work as passively as possible, but there is always going to be an element of fine tuning. And what you find is it probably takes one or two winter and summer phases to go through. Whilst, you know, the, the building users get to learn how the building works, we understand how the system responds to different um, parameters. Um, and once we've done that, then hopefully, you know, the systems will, will, uh, will be working as we, as we expected at day one. And I think that's, um, that's me.